was an old empire, it was highly centralized. Uh, everything was decided from the top. People were just small parts in a big machinery. They were not motivated, they did not want to defend it anymore. Great civilizations are not murdered. Instead, they take their own lives. They rise, develop, reach their summit, and then they collapse. Such collapses have occurred many times in human history, and no civilization is immune to the vulnerabilities that may lead a society to its end. No matter how seemingly great it is, the key to their unavoidable destiny seems to be a battle. In my opinion, you can describe much of the history of civilization as simply a constant battle between the forces of centralization and decentralization. And uh, what happens spontaneously in any organization, but certainly also in any civilization, is that it by itself becomes more and more centralized. Regardless of how well things are going in the present moment, the situation can always change. Putting aside species-ending events like an asteroid strike or deadly pandemic, history tells us that it's usually a plethora of factors that contribute to the collapse. What are they? And which, if any, have already begun to surface? The greatest power of all had experienced a bouquet of factors before it imploded under its own weight. One example was the Roman Empire that collapsed when they were invaded by disorganized tribesmen from the north. How could that happen? This sophisticated empire that had built Hadrian's Wall and so on, how could that collapse like that? Complexity has a cost. This is one of the most important lessons from the collapse of the Roman Empire. By the end of 100 BC, the Romans had spread across the Mediterranean to the places most easily accessed by sea. They could have stopped there, but things were going well and they felt empowered to expand to new frontiers by land. Transportation by sea was economical, however, transportation across land was slow and expensive. All the while, they were overextending themselves and running up costs. The empire managed to remain stable in the ensuing centuries through an extremely heavy central administration. But repercussion for spreading themselves too thin caught up with them in the third century, which was plagued by civil war, invasions, famine due to the unproductive agriculture. All the warning signs were present in Rome. But it was an old empire, it was highly centralized. Uh, everything was decided from the top. People were just small parts in a big machinery. They were not motivated, they did not want to defend it anymore. By the 3rd century, Rome was increasingly adding new things 
An army doubled the size, a cavalry subdivided provinces that each needed their own bureaucracies, courts and defences, just to maintain its status quo and keep from sliding backwards. Eventually, it could no longer afford to prop up those heightened complexities. It was fiscal weakness, not war, that stabbed the empire into its heart. But Rome was not the first or the last empire to commit suicide. We have seen 200 civilizations, roughly 200 civilizations, collapse through history. And uh, different historians and scientists have looked into what are the main causes for such collapse. Empires last about 250 years or 10 generations. They don't begin or end on a certain date, but they do end. It happens when under the guise of renewal, tribes, armies and organizations appear and devour the heritage of the former superpower, often from within. Every new empire begins with the age of the pioneers. Courageous individuals with passion and vision conquer new territories and then take over the remnants of an earlier collapsed civilization. The new empire then enters an age of commerce. Great wealth is created through enterprise and trade, making use of the best cultural traits and technological achievements of the vanquished empire. Next comes the age of affluence. It's a critical juncture in the life circle of an empire and it's also the age when things begin to go wrong. A certain number of books and academic studies have been published about how bad it had gone before an empire imploded under its own weight. One of the authors was the legendary teacher at the Georgetown University in USA, Carol Quigley, who presented the factors behind the rise and fall of civilization in his masterpiece, The Evolution of Civilizations. So Carol quickly described how typically one single phenomenon led to the demise of civilization. And that means that uh, when you have centralized a lot, you build institutions and you make rules and commands and, and uh, structures that are so complicated and so inflexible that it stops working. The meltdown of the over-institutionalized central system is a well-known mechanism in every fallen empire, despite the apparent benefits. And you can think of uh, many benefits of uh, central, centralizing. Uh, most people know about economies of scale, which means that, okay, so if, if we have a lot of people doing the same thing, uh, we can share the same infrastructures and so on, that gives some benefits. I think uh, within any unit or organization, whether that be um, uh, a company or a nation, uh, you will need some centralized structures and some decentralized uh, structures, and depending on the nature of them. So, if you take a nation, uh, defense is what economists call a public good. And that means that uh, if um, my neighbor is paying to uh, defending his uh, house <laughs> against uh, the enemy uh, approaching, it would be impossible for me not to benefit from that. So you need a centralized structure there. You can't have half the city paying to the defense and the other half not paying. And you need, and you need to have a common idea about who's the enemy and how to defend yourselves. 
the management problem when you make a system bigger and bigger grows exponentially and that means when you have these very very big social structures they have huge management problems at its height the roman empire stretched from the atlantic ocean all the way to the Euphrates River in the Middle East. But its grandeur may have also been its downfall. With such a vast territory to govern, the empire faced an administrative nightmare. Mismanagement was the cruel realty in Rome and it was more than just difficult to govern the overgrown empire. Ineffective and inconsistent to leadership, corruption, over-reliance on slave labor and massive invasion by barbarian tribes only served to magnify the problem. Being the ruler of Rome had always been a particularly dangerous job, but during the second and third centuries it nearly became a death sentence. With the fall of the last emperor, the Roman civilization drew its terminal breath. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, Europe started to disintegrate into smaller units. And it was actually a, a slow process where it disintegrated more and more. This process meant that you got more and more small city-states. And at one point there were about 5,000 city-states in Europe. The name city-state was initially given to the political form that crystallized during the classical period of Greek civilization. The origin of city-state is disputed. It is probable that earlier tribal systems broke up during a period of economic decline. Then, the splintered groups established themselves between 800 and 700 BC as an independent chain of city-states. They covered peninsular Greece, the Aegean Islands and Western Asia Minor. Why all of a sudden, between 8 and 700 BC, do we have this explosion of something called a polis, a city-state? Well, to answer these questions, we've got to remember when the pre-industrial, pre-scientific world and that means we're in the agricultural world. Today in America, we're eating, one out of 100 people produces the food for us to survive one more day. That means 99 of us can make movies, we can drive, we can conduct open heart surgery, we can build a freeway. That was not true in the ancient world. It took nine out of 10 people to produce food. So if you're going to look at changes in culture, you better look at agriculture. And lo and behold, when we go back to Greece between 800 and 700, we see a revolution, both a social and a scientific one. Somewhere around 8 to 700, people began to master the art of grafting, and that meant that they could take very fertile cultivars of fruit trees, we're talking everything from plums to olives, and graft them onto very durable species of uh, olives that had roots. Uh, a wild olive is all root and no fruit, and a cultivated olive is all fruit and no root. So if you can combine the two, you can start to expand the area where these species can be grown and they get much more productive. The particularism of the Greek city-states was for centuries their glory. They were quite many, and with Sparta and Athens being the strongest ones, they maintained curious relationships with one another. The engine of this relationship was co-petition, which is the state of constant competition and cooperation. Xerxes, king of the enormous Persian Empire, had turned his attention toward the city-states who dared to resist his will. In the eye of its golden age, Greece was in peril. The state of this competition in ancient Greece was the key to withstand the invasion from the east. 
The historian claims that the army assembled by Xerxes was the largest in existence, unlike anything the world had seen before. It contained soldiers from all over Asia of 30 different ethnicities, and that did not take into account the numerous Thracian tribes that Xerxes encountered on his way to Greece, which were added to his numbers, either willingly or by force. At the time of the Persian threat, the Ten Years' Alliance was all that stood against Persia's domination of Greece and thereby all of Europe. The alliance held stand. This was an army that no Greek city-state hoped to take on alone. The Greeks, however, had not been dawdling this whole time. Ever since they repelled the first Persian invasion under Darius, they knew it was only a matter of time before a new one would come. The Athenians, in particular, who were Xerxes' main target, had been busy building up their fleet for an unrelated war with another city-state named Aegina. At Marathon, the first Persian invasion force was decisively defeated. At Thamapili, the sacrifice of a few made ultimate victory possible. And also on the water at Salamis, the city-states were superior in the first great naval battle recorded in history. The Greek triumph ensured the survival of the Greek culture and political structures long after the demise of the Persian Empire. It was those battles fought more than two millennia ago that preserved a way of life and shaped the future of humanity. With the crushing defeat at Salamis, the Persian king Xerxes had little choice but to consider withdrawal. Greece was at last free from the threat of the Eastern domination. Over the next half century, Athens remained the strongest naval power in the world, while Sparta maintained the finest army. The differences between them, however, increased the competition and distrust that for a time had simmered just below the surface. Following these two encounters, Xerxes had gained control over the regions of Euboea, Boeotia, and Phocis, and, and most importantly, he had a clear route to Attica, where Athens was located. In September 480 BC, Xerxes entered Athens. The next great threat to the future of Greece was to come from within. But for some centuries yet to come, the city-states kept gaining power and wealth until they fell to the Romans in 146 BC. the origins are supposedly classical, Greek and Roman. In those terms, we have kind of a model of what Western civilization was at its origins. It was Athens and Rome, and then it was enriched by Judaism and Christianity through Jerusalem. And that meant that roughly from around 700 BC, with the rise of the Greek city-state, to the end of the Roman Empire in the fifth century AD, we had about 1,200 years of a globalized Mediterranean culture that provided the legacy for what we enjoy today. From the soil of ancient Greece, the Roman Empire, and medieval Western Christianity, our civilization was born. It emerged from the Middle Ages to experience such transformative episodes as the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, the Scientific Revolution, and the development of liberal democracy. If you go back a thousand years, it seems like that the people living in Western Europe, which is where the West came from, they were actually less prosperous than people in most other parts of the world. They were even probably less prosperous than people in Africa. And then during the thousand years that came after that, certainly the West started to accelerate ahead of everyone else. So what made that possible? 
where do they get these ideas? The city-states geography, the city-states city racial pool, it was no different than anywhere else. Greeks were not inherently smarter than Africans or stupider than Africans. The climate was not better in Greece than it was in Malta, for example. What happened was that for a variety of reasons, the collapse of civilizations on the Mycenaeans, the Dark Ages, people were left on their own, they began to develop a Mediterranean triad, they began to create agricultural surpluses, the population began to thrive, they had a method of conflict resolution that was quick and logical, they had a political representation, they had outlets for individual expression and economic activity, and all of this which originated with the idea of the small family farmer uh, flourished and came into its own uh, through city-states. One of the reasons was that in Germany when somebody died the uh, a farmer's land would then be divided uh, between each of his sons and if he had two or three or four sons his land ownings would then be divided in smaller units and so this process meant that uh, you got more and more small uh, city-states and at one point there were about 5,000 city-states in Europe and what I find so fascinating is that if you look at the map of where these city-states were over time it corresponds extremely well with where most of the innovation in Europe took place so the correlation is so strong that it cannot be a coincidence but there are explanations for that National Bureau of Economic Research in the US did a study on the migration patterns of every single city-state in Europe over a definite period of time. And it turned out that people would systematically leave the city-states that, uh, that were called princelings, so the, the ones that were led by a royal family, and they would migrate to the other city-states that you would call merchants. So these were the city-states that were ruled by common people. So councils of common people. So when the princelings, they were suppressing people, they were simply losing economic power. And uh, the, these more decentralized city-states, they were gaining economic power. There were many city-states and they would experiment and compete in many ways, which resulted in different models to organize a society. We know that the West, and particular parts of the West, grew rich because of decentralization. It, it starts in, in northern Italy with the city-states. There's no coordinated uh, one kingdom up there as there is in the south of Italy. That means that single city-states can't really suppress their citizens. They can't suppress new ideas, uh, because if they do so, Whomever has the idea, whomever has the initiative, just moves to the next city-state. And in that way you had innovation not only in technology or in commerce, but you also had innovation in how to run a society. And people could vote with their feet. They would always go to the best place. Just like people vote with a wallet or with their feet in a marketplace. Decentralized systems allow that creativity to take little roots. Um, it's like an ecosystem. You know, if you think about how nature works, you know, um, nature has all sorts of experiments going on everywhere all the time. You know, little permutations in the DNA, right, that changes something. During the last seven million years, it has been typical for there to be several different species of hominid in the world at any one time. And now we're alone. And I think the fact that we're the only hominid in the world speaks something very profound about us and reflects the fact that we are very different from any of our, our precursors. And then you see like locally, oh, you know, this is actually a great permutation. And suddenly it starts spreading throughout the ecosystem.
We have similarities with everything in the entire ecosystem and yet, we are extraordinary creatures. We are rational animals, pursuing knowledge for its own sake. We live by art, culture and reasoning. Wrote Aristotle in his philosophical work. The last few years I've been working principally on the question of how human beings became the extraordinary creatures uh, that there are, they are. What we do is to sort of disassociate, disassemble our environment in our minds into a mass of mental symbols. And then we can move these symbols around and recombine them to come up with new versions of the world, with new explanations of the world and alternatives to existing reality. Six thousand years ago, in an effort to unite people, our ancestors began to design telegraphic symbols to represent beliefs and to identify affiliations. These symbols connected like-minded people, and they are all extraordinary. These affiliations allowed us to feel safer and more secure in groups, and the sharing created consensus around what the symbols represented. With these marks, you knew where you fit in, both for the people that were in the in-crowd and those, as importantly, that were excluded. These symbols were created in what I consider to be a very bottom-up manner. They were made by people, for people, and then shared for free. If we can mimic the same thing inside organizations, so if we can actually break down large organizations into much smaller decentralized units, then suddenly every unit can start experimenting. And the good experiments, they, they go like a wildfire throughout the ecosystem. The bad experiments, they die. In the medieval age, most innovation, creativity and hereby most wealth were concentrated in a wedge running from northern Italy up through Germany, the eastern part of France, and there were also a number of successful city-states scattered over Spain. It's the same that happens in the Netherlands, which is actually a, a federation of provinces where you can't really check things, and it's the same that happens in the United Kingdom after the Glorious Revolution of 1688, where Parliament and the King check each other, which means that, that there's suddenly no real regulation of what people can do, and there is very, very good protection of the property rights. So this explains why Europe suddenly became so creative and then so wealthy. The perspective to understand how decentralization made the civilization of West so creative and wealthy, the creators of this film have found in books. A massively great number of precious books. Because without books, the development of civilization would have been simply impossible. They are engines of change, windows on the world and lighthouses erected in a sea of time. Books are companions, teachers, magicians and bankers of the treasures of the mind. Books are humanity in print. The printing press is a device that allows for the mass production of uniform printed matter, mainly text in the form of books, pamphlets and newspapers. No one knows when the first printing press was invented, or who invented it. But the oldest known printed text originated in China during the first millennium AD. Goldsmith and inventor Johannes Gutenberg began experimenting with printing in Strasbourg in France in 1440. 
10 years later, he had a printing machine perfected and ready to use commercially, the Gothenburg Press. Knowledge is power, as the saying goes, and the invention of the mechanical movable type printing press helped disseminate knowledge wider and faster than ever before. The Italian Renaissance began nearly a century before Gutenberg invented his printing press, when 14th century political leaders in Italian city-states like Rome and Florence set out to revive the ancient Roman educational system that had produced giants like Caesar, Cicero and Seneca. Fortunately, we know exactly where these first printers were located and that can help us to identify from where exactly in Western Europe the takeoff was driven and why. Most printing activity was concentrated along the main rivers, but not all that many along the coastlines. Water access is not really needed for small-scale book printing, so this is probably indicative of where people were most innovative and advanced along rivers. In the medieval age, people needed water access for trade, but they were probably too military exposed when they lived on the seafront. There are some preconditions that we did find in Western Europe. One of them is that you had uh, seas around it where, where you could sail, you had good rivers, you could navigate. But yet, a thousand years ago, they were still behind. So what was it that happened? We had a period about 500 years where northern Italy, the current Switzerland, Germany and northern Europe consisted of up to several thousand city-states. And if we looked at what happened in those city-states, it was remarkable because you had an explosion in innovation. So the decentralization there is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The decentralization in northern, northern Italy is the beginning of the modern banking system and modern science. So my theory is that it was decentralization that created the West. That means that it's Western Europe and those particular parts of Western Europe that suddenly, sometime in the 18th century, race away from the rest of the world. Civilizations come to Earth and fall into dust. And to prevent this fall here and now, humanity has profound decisions to make. Some to be taken collectively, others individually. Even if one decries Western civilization and wants to change it, there's no denying of the enormous effect it has had on the human prospect. Nothing would be more foolish than to take it for granted. Why? Because Western civilization constitutes a distinct legacy within the overall human heritage. A civilization unrecognized or insufficiently recognized by its putative heirs is a civilization at existential risk. Every civilization in the past had a core where spontaneous creativity could find fertile soil to grow in. Where and when did this creative core blossom in Europe? What were the conditions for creativity to spread and develop? What does creativity mean to a well-organized society? Well, I think all, uh, all wealth and all development stems to some extent from creativity because the, 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 the main distinguisher between a human and, and other animals is the fact that we have a, a rational capacity to, to actually be creative. You know, we're not the fastest guys on the, on the desert. But that we have a free-flowing free way of thinking where every option out there gets on the table, I think is really important to make the right decision. And so I think creativity coming up with all the different ways of looking at possibilities and options and what you can do is essential for making the best choices. You know, we're not the, we're not the guys with the sharpest teeth, but we're the smartest of, of, of any animals.
societies that are sustainable in the long term are generally not characterized by having many resources. Then what is their key to success? Follow the story of decentralization in chapter 3.